give a stand and, and give a warm foundation welcome to Pastor Chris this morning as he shares with you. Good morning, Foundation Church. So good to be with you in so many ways. Um, sorry for your trouble and all that you're going through. Um, but we want to be here to link arms and to uh, do what we can to reach uh, the people that need hope. So, uh, so my name is Chris, and my wife Bethany and our family are here, okay? And so we get to travel the country and do disaster relief and training. And we travel as a family. Uh, we have four kids, ages five to nine. So you do the math. <laughs> and uh, our kids love being here. They uh, have grown to love your church family very quickly, just as we have. And uh, they love to serve as well. I've been full-time with Christ in Action since 2010, and uh, that is how I met my wife. Uh, Bethany's been, uh, actually I started, uh, I'm kind of like your pastor, I'm a little IT geek, okay? A little photo, uh, I came on doing media and IT for Christ in Action and then moved to operations in 2013. And uh, that was when Bethany and I started uh, dating, got married, and here we are. But Bethany has been doing Christ in Action pretty much her whole life and did her first full-time disaster relief deployment after 9-11. And Christ in Action was on the Pentagon parking lot feeding and ministering to recovery workers. And we were doing mass feeding. And so that was uh, looked like... 5,000 hot breakfast by 7 a.m., and Bethany was in charge of that. And uh, did the same thing at Ground Zero. And that was our door into ministry. And then at Katrina, uh, we did distribution. You guys know a little bit about that. And they estimate roughly $10 million worth of product was came in and then was distributed to the residents that were flooded after Katrina. And we did mass feeding there and we got to share the gospel and see people get saved. And my wife got to meet President George W. Bush while she was down there after Katrina. FEMA would later tell us that we had the single largest feeding and distribution site on the Gulf Coast. There were other organizations that had multiple sites, um, but apparently we were the single largest feeding and distribution site. And so we are coming to you um, on the heels of two back-to-back -back tornado deployments. We were in Omaha for four weeks. Then we were in Greenfield for two weeks, Greenfield, Iowa. And um, by the time we got home, you guys were getting a lot of rain. And so we uh, ended up coming back to Iowa. And so Iowa is uh, quickly becoming near and dear to our hearts. And um, Bethany and I were ordained, so we were a little late uh, to get out to Omaha when we went out there, but um, we are thrilled to be just serving the Lord in whatever he has us, wherever he has us. And right now, that's in Spencer, Iowa with you. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of this church and for being faithful in your giving so that we can um, link arms with you and be Christ in action. Uh, and so if you want to uh, get involved, we do need volunteers. And I know many of you are, are very tired, and that's understandable. Uh, if you know somebody, 18 or older, that wants to pitch in and help, um, man, there's a sign up out there. We'd love to talk with you afterward. If you or someone you know still needs help cleaning out uh, what was damaged from the flood, please talk with us. We want to help them. There are flyers and business cards and QR codes uh, so that we can get connected with you. All right? So we're going to be in Ephesians 1 this morning. And you can turn there if you want. 
If you don't have your Bibles, you can just listen when I go through this. And when we break it down, it'll be on the screen, okay? But I love the sign out front of the church. What does it say? Store treasures in heaven. And when we talk about storing treasures in heaven, one of the other words that the Bible uses to talk about those kind of things is blessing. Blessing is one of those churchy words, isn't it? What's a, what's a blessing? Well, blessing is, is favor and goodwill. You just, you want the best for someone. And you, you want to bless them. And so we're going to talk this morning about spiritual blessings. And Paul, as he's writing in, in Ephesians to this church that he helps start, he's writing from, we believe he's writing from prison. And I'm going to read this morning from chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. So follow along if you can. If not, just, just listen, and then we'll break it down. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So in verse 3, he starts off, he, he said, said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's a lot of blessing. So the first, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That blessed is, he's giving praise to God. He's lifting high the name of Christ. He's, he's saying thanks be to God. The second blessed who has blessed us in Christ is that idea of favor or goodwill. So he has given us, he has, he has shown favor on us. You want what's best for your kids, right? And so that's what God has shown to us. He is Bless us. He has shown favor to us. Bless us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. That blessing is a benefit. It's something that we, we, we get. We receive. And so, praise be to God 
who has shown favor on us with every spiritual benefit in heavenly places. But what is this spiritual blessing? I mean, that's kind of hard to wrap your hands around if it's spiritual. Well, let's talk about what it's not. A spiritual blessing is not something that is material. It's not something that is of this world. Spiritual blessing, some of it we're not going to see this side of heaven. So let's, I want to talk this morning about what are six spiritual blessings that we have the opportunity to receive and experience because we're in Christ. All right, so what is the spiritual blessing? In verse 4, he starts off with, it says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So this, is the, this spiritual blessing goes back before the foundation of the world. So this one's been around for a long time. He chose us to be holy and blameless before him. The result of being chosen is that we are considered set apart. That's what holy is, right? It's totally other. God is holy, and he has set us apart to be holy and blameless and without fault before God. And so sometimes we walk around and, and maybe we'll talk about it or we'll think about it like, oh, hey, God is, God is blessing me because I've got... I've got all this, or I've got all that, or I've got my family, or... Fill in the blank. But if we just talk about and think about our physical blessings, we're really doing ourselves and everyone around us a disservice. Because as many of you have experienced, that can be taken away in an instant. So number one, what's... What's the first spiritual blessing? He chose us to be holy and blameless before him. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. It says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. So number two is, he predestined us for adoption as fellow heirs with Christ. So adoption, by definition, is the act or fact of legally taking another's child and bringing it up as your own. So taking someone that's not your own. And we, as sinful, fallen humans, the Bible says that we were by nature children of wrath. And after the fall, after sin entered this world, we did not belong to God. And so God made a way. Ephesians 2, so flip over a page, verses 1 to 3 says... And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We'll look at the next verses in a minute. But let's talk for a minute about adoption, okay? Anybody in here adopted or adoptive parents? Awesome. 
That is so cool. Bethany and I feel like someday God's going to call us to do that. And that is, it's not an easy thing. Adoption. There's intention. God intentionally pursued us. You don't just fall into becoming an adoptive parent, right? You got a, you got a purpose to be an adoptive parent. And God intentionally adopted us. He pursued us. Adoption also involves choice. There's a choice involved. You can choose whether you adopt a child or not. And so God chose you. He chose us. Adoption also involves sacrifice. Amen? It's not a simple process. It's not without sacrifice. It costs you something. I, don't, I didn't even look up what the average cost of an adoption is these days. Uh, national or international. Oh my goodness. Tens of thousands of dollars. It involves sacrifice. Not just material sacrifice. Emotional sacrifice. And God gave his son... For us, sacrificed physically, but also went through hell for us. That is sacrifice. We are adopted. The other thing about adoption is it is final. And uh, if you look uh, in the Bible, adopted children had more rights than birth children in a lot of cases. There is nothing you can do to undo that adoption. They could not be denied their inheritance. Interesting, right? And we, now, we are not children of wrath. We're adopted into God's family. And it does. It does have benefits, right? Adoption has benefits. We have an inheritance as heirs. Back to Ephesians 1, in 11, verse 11, and he says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, why would God promise us an inheritance? It's not so that we can walk around with a puffed up chest and flaunt it to the world. We want to invite them in, but... We're not supposed to be proud about it. If you look at Ephesians 1, 12, verse 12 in the Amplified, it tells us. It says, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ, who first put our confidence in him as our Lord and Savior, would exist to the praise of his glory. And so this adoption, this inheritance is so that we can praise and glorify Him. So, first spiritual blessing is He chose us to be holy and blameless. Second spiritual blessing is He predestined us for adoption as fellow heirs with Christ. Number three is in verses 7 and 8 of Ephesians 1. It says, In Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Let's talk about redemption for a minute. So, my kids, uh, this is the first state. So, my, when my uh, five-year-old was six months old, he had spent more of his life outside of Virginia than he did in Virginia, which is where we live. All right. So by the time he was, I don't know, a year, I'm getting the numbers wrong. He had been to like, I don't know, 18 states. So we traveled a lot. And this is the first state that they've been in where you can collect the cans for 
recycling and getting the five cents. <laughs> and so they made this discovery, and this was like opening a small business. <laughs> And they start collecting and they're looking at every can and every bottle and and they're they're gathering and putting it in a special bin. And mom, where's you know, how do we how do we get the the money? And um, so we explained it and we said, okay, we're gonna go one time to the redemption center while we're here. Um, but they were they were excited about being able to redeem cans for a nickel. <laughs> Webster says, redemption is the act of serving to offset or compensate for a deficit. If you look at the biblical meaning of redemption, it's a releasing, effected by payment of a ransom. Deliverance, liberation, procured by the payment of a ransom. The Old Testament sacrificial system was a temporary, imperfect, earthly solution to a potentially eternal, heavenly problem. If you're not familiar, as familiar with that, there's a passage in Hebrews 9 that explains it perfectly. And I'm going to read verses 11 through 14. So Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. So this is one of those spiritual blessings that God has given to us. It's our redemption. He paid the ransom for us. But notice, at the end of that passage, it's not just so that we can be redeemed and feel good about ourselves and secure in our eternity. It's so that we can worship the living God. So number three is, he redeemed us so that we can worship the living God. Redemption is a blessing. It's a gift. Number four is also in verse seven of Ephesians one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. So number four is he forgave us according to the riches of his grace. And forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. Right? You hear that cliche that God forgets your sins? Not really. God's not like, oops, I forgot. Forgiveness is, it's not eliminating your sins. It's, it's more of a covering of your sin. And so when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees Jesus covering your sin. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 7 says, But God, right? We talked about how we were children of wrath. These are the next verses. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love 
with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ. Now that sounds like a blessing. <coughs> grace is mentioned again. Do we have any idea how abundantly blessed we are to have God's grace? Where would we be without the grace of God? So that's number four. He forgave us according to the riches of his grace. The fifth spiritual blessing is in verses nine and 10. I'm gonna read these in the, in the Amplified. I love how it puts it. It says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ with regard to the fulfillment of the times. That is the end of history, the climax of the ages. To bring all things together in Christ, both things in the heavens and things on the earth. This mystery. How many of you like a good mystery? Right? My wife, we're watching the movie and she's telling me what's going to happen at the end before it even comes. Uh, my kids are into the boxcar children books, right? Maybe you remember the Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, right? Everybody loves a good mystery. But what mystery is he talking about here? It's the greatest mystery of all time. How will a holy God be reunited with his fallen sinful humanity? It's the mystery of says he made known to us the mystery of his will. So many people get wrapped up in the mystery of God's will, right? Does God will? Am I supposed to do this or that? Am I supposed to move here or there? Am I supposed to, you know, walk down this street or that street? Well, in case you're confused about that, Second or uh, First Timothy tells us God desires, he wills all men to come to repentance, to come to the knowledge of Him, that all would be saved from their sin. And so this mystery has been revealed in Christ to show the goodness of God. And by the way, according to His good pleasure, God's delighted to reveal this mystery to us. He loves it when people Come to him and discover the truth of who he is. So one day, those who believe will be part of a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be a oneness and a unity. That's what Pastor preached about last week, right? Comes together, both things in heaven and things on the earth. There at the end of verse 10. So, spiritual blessing number five, he revealed his will to us in Christ. The sixth and the last one we'll talk about today, that sixth spiritual blessing, let's read verses 13 and 14. It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> so number six, God sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? I mean, I sealed an envelope yesterday before I put it in the mail. Being sealed is to be marked by the Holy Spirit. When uh, in, in those days, a seal was typically thought of like a, like a wax seal.
seal. When Bethany and I got married, um, it sealed our invitations. Believe it or not, they have wax kits. So you take and you melt wax, and you put it on the envelope, and then there's this little imprint that you put. And the kings and the officials back in biblical times would use their ring with a, an, an imprint on it to, to seal messages that would be sent out. And so the seal did a couple things. The seal marked that message. And you and I are marked, we should be marked with the imprint of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You should have Jesus written all over you. And so that's the first thing it does. It marks, the Holy Spirit marks us. He leaves an impression on us. And then we therefore leave an impression on those we touch. The seal also adds authenticity to that message. It's genuine. That message, it, it really did come from the king. It really did come from an authority. And that message is authentic. The seal also denotes integrity. Integrity is just consistency with the original. Right? You ever play the telephone game when you were little? Whisper down the lane? I, I said when you were little, not now. What happens by the time it gets two or three people down the road? Completely different message. But the seal of the Holy Spirit, the seal of the King on that message shows authenticity. It is true to the original. And so when we receive this blessing, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, we're saying that there's, there's integrity in the message that you carry. There is consistency with the truth, with, with the word of God. It truly is his words that you're speaking. And so that's the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the spiritual blessing of the Holy Spirit. So, number one, he chose us to be holy and blameless. Number two, he predestined us for adoption as fellow heirs with Christ. Number three, he redeemed us so that we can worship the living God. Number four, he forgave us according to the riches of his grace. Five, he revealed to us his will in Christ. And six, he sealed us with the Holy Spirit. So these are all great to talk about. But what do we do when we struggle to realize these spiritual blessings? Or when, when our earthly blessings might be taken away? How can we shift our mindset about the blessing of God? How can we focus on storing up treasures in heaven? I believe that we need to lift our eyes from what is here to what is coming. Mm -hmm. Lift our eyes from the things of this world to the one who created this world Amen. and created you and me. We lift our eyes. Psalm 121 verses one and two says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. A couple of things about these verses. This is from a psalm of ascents. This is when the, the Jews would go into Jerusalem and Jerusalem was situated high. They'd have to do some climbing. They'd have to put some effort in. So, man, one of the things they would do while they were walking along is... They would sing. They would sing these songs. And so this, this psalm is not, it's not a, a lament song. It's, it, it's not a sad song. 
the psalmist is actually saying that he's not saying where is my help going to come from he's saying where is my help coming from he knows he expects help to come and so he's asking a rhetorical question where does my help come from it comes from from the Lord when he says I lift up my eyes to lift up is to to bear something to carry something that takes that takes an effort it's not an easy thing to remove yourself from the distractions of this world to lift up your eyes so his assumption is we all we all need help so many times we've, we've talked to people and said, oh yeah, I know my grandson, I know my son, I know my neighbor. And we ask if they need help and they're like, oh no, we got it, we're okay. We still got work to do, but we're, we're okay. The psalmist is, say, is he's presuming that we all need help. Why do we think we can do it on our own? We need each other. You need community. And so if you're struggling to lift your eyes to realize these spiritual blessing, blessings, man, link arms with those that are around you. And you're allowed to ask for help. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Lord is in all caps. That's not just some God out there. That is the name of the almighty creator of heaven and earth. The self-existing one who always was, who always is, and who always will be. He's the one that is bringing your help. So I just want to take, uh, take a minute and just think about what God has done for you. Not necessarily physically here on this earth. Think about these spiritual blessings. Think about He created you. He has sustained you. He saved you. He has redeemed you. He has forgiven you. And he has sealed you with the Holy Spirit, given you that comforter. He's put you in a community that can help you and can love you. So what do we do when we struggle to realize these spiritual blessings? We lift our eyes from our circumstance to our Savior. And we expect our help to come from the Lord. Help is coming. He is present with you. Whether you realize it or not, He is with you. And maybe you're, maybe you're not struggling in this area. Who is he putting around you? Who is God putting around you? Who is he put in front of you that needs that support? That needs that comfort? That needs that prayer? Man, pick up your eyes to just pay attention to who's around you too. We don't want to miss what God is going to do in and through you. Um, I, I love just being here and serving, um, serving with Pastor Nicholas and Megan. And when I was here initially and I got to tell them that it looked like you, you were going to be able to come and partner with you guys, um, he started crying and then he told me that he said, I wanted to be the one to go in and clean out every one of these homes. And 
they were serving, they are serving through the thousands of people and products that came in and out of this building and now the building up the street. Man, what a difference. What an amazing impact. Don't miss the spiritual blessings just because the physical has been disrupted. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that you have given us blessings beyond this world. God, you have you have bestowed on us more than we could ever ask or imagine. God, we, we need you. Lord, help us when we get distracted by what's going on around us and we forget to lift our eyes. Lord, thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit to comfort us or to empower us to, to minister to our neighbors and to speak truth and life and the message that you've given us, the, the message of the gospel. Lord, we thank you for the, the opportunity that we have to bring them.